Um, good morning. Great to see you all. Keep that page open. It's page 947. It's the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. We are, as Rick said in this new series, Irresistible Jesus. And we hear, as part of this ongoing year of evangelism that we're still in, Invite 2012. And we want to be here because of a question that was once asked that I think uh, inspires this series. And actually it comes from the Gospel of John in chapter 12 where two Greeks approach the disciples of Jesus and they ask them a question. And they say, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Sir, we would like to see Jesus. And I think that's something that we all want, isn't it? That's who we want to meet. That's why we come every Sunday. That's why we gather together in connect groups. It's not to learn new things. It's not to do new things. It is to meet with Jesus. So the aim of this series is to get everything else out of the way. To get ourselves out of the way. To get church out of the way. To get our traditions out of the way. And simply to introduce you to the unadulterated, irresistible Jesus. And that might be for you for the first time, the first time you've heard about him, the first time you've met him. But perhaps for you it's a, it's a fresh look and we hope it's provocative and compelling. And I'm confident as you meet Jesus that you will find him almost irresistible. So this is an eight-week-long series, so come along on Sundays. Uh, if you haven't done the Alpha course, as Rick has already mentioned, uh, we're encouraging everybody to do that as a kind of a, a way of a, a, a something accompanying uh, this series, because it's a great place to meet Jesus for the first time. Well, we're not in John's Gospel, we're actually in Mark's Gospel, so why have we turned there? Well, it's because, uh, first of all, it's the first gospel. So in a sense, we're going back to the original source, the original account of Jesus. But also, it's what I like to call the tabloid gospel. It's very short, it's pithy, it's action-packed, it's fast-paced. It's a little bit like you just woke up, woken up in the morning and somebody has <laughs> kindly... I, I think I might move to the other mic if that's all right. Um, How's that? Is that a bit better? I'll turn this one off. Somebody has very kindly and quietly put a cold flannel in your face, rubbed it around just to wake you up in the morning. That's how Mark 1 kind of comes to us. And over these eight weeks, we're going to look at who is Jesus and what difference does he make to our lives. And as we do that, I just want to encourage you to uh, perhaps not just come on the Alpha course, not just come on Sundays, but actually read for yourselves about this Jesus that Mark presents to us, this irresistible Jesus. And I just want to share with you two resources that I found really helpful. Uh, the first is a, a short commentary. It's a kind of daily readings called Mark for Everyone by Tom Wright. Uh, Really easy read, quite vivid, some great uh, illustrations and analogies. Uh, about six ninety nine, oh, eight ninety nine. I'd really encourage you to get one of those and read along in Mark's Gospel. Uh, the other book that I'd recommend, uh, I always have a Tim Keller to recommend, and uh, here's another one: The King's Cross. It's his sermon series on Mark's Gospel, and it's fantastic. So I'd really encourage you uh, to get a look at that. But this morning we're looking at chapter one, and the title of the sermon is "The Irresistible King." And Mark is, is kind of answering the question, why should we bother considering the life of this particular man in the first place? I met him when I was 15 years old, and uh, he uh, grabbed my heart and changed my life, and I've been enamored with him ever since. But Mark doesn't just want you to take his word for it or my word for it. He sets up instead a number of witnesses that give testimony to who they think Jesus is. And so this morning we're going to look at three of those testimonies, three of those witnesses. Uh, firstly, the witness of the writer, Mark himself. Secondly, the witness of the messenger, that's John the Baptist. And thirdly, and most extraordinarily of all, the witness of the Father, God himself. So let's start with the witness of the writer. And we're going to look at verses 1 to 3. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, 
As it is written in the Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Mark here is capturing our attention. He says, listen, this is worth hearing. This is huge. This is significant. Miss it and you miss out. And so what we're going to do, we're going to read verse 1 very, very slowly. So it begins, the beginning. In Greek, that word is arche, from where we get archaeology. And it just says, beginning. Just like Hosea's prophecy or John's gospel. And all of them are echoing the words of Genesis, the first words in the Bible, in the beginning. And Mark is saying here, something as significant as creation is taking place. And it's a theme that Mark doesn't let go of. Look at verse 10. As Jesus comes up out of the water at his baptism, a dove descends upon him. There's only one other time where the Spirit is uh, uh, described as a dove, and it's in the Aramaic version of Genesis chapter 1, where the Spirit as a dove flutters, say the rabbis, over creation. Verse 13, you see Jesus tempted. He's in the wilderness with the wild animals. Just like Adam was tempted, surrounded by the garden with all the animals that he's named. Adam sins, but Jesus resists the enemy. Is this a new Eden? Is this a new Adam? You see, Mark is deliberately pointing us back to creation. He's saying the world is going to be redeemed. This is the rescue, the renewal of all things. It begins here. But with what? When he says the good news, the word good news, euangelion in the Greek, we uh, often translate as gospel. And it was news, not advice. It's an announcement, not instruction. In the first century, it might have been a report from a battlefield of a great victory. It might have been uh, the report of a coronation of a new emperor or simply the news that it was his birthday today. But this is not just any old good news. This is the good news. There is no other good news like this. This is the only news that is truly good, says Mark. And he's referring to something quite specific because uh, he takes this phrase, the good news, from Isaiah. Not this quote that we have here, but Isaiah 52 and 61. And there Isaiah speaks of the good news of God's coming rule and reign. The invasion of God's kingdom into the world to rescue and liberate his people. So Mark's saying here, God is doing something at last that is as significant as creation itself. And it's good news, remarkably, he says, about Jesus the Messiah. He says this is about the life of a Galilean man who was raised in Capernaum. He was a rabbi. He had the reputation as a wonder worker. He was a bit of a revolutionary and a subversive and who was finally executed by the Romans. But it is in this life that we see God's saving action. And it's because of two things. It's because this Jesus, this Galilean, is the Messiah. Now, You probably know this, but it's always worth saying, Christ isn't Jesus' surname. It's his title. So Christ means king. It's saying this is King Jesus. He's royal. He's the one who administers, who inaugurates this new reign of God, this kingdom of God. He is the one who represents Israel because he's their king, and he's the one who will renew Israel. Quite literally, he is the anointed one. So just as David was anointed king by the prophet Samuel, just as Cyrus was described as the anointed one as he sends the exiles home, just as Judas Maccabeus was described as the Messiah because he defeated the Romans and cleansed the temple, here is Jesus the anointed one. But he is anointed not with oil, but with the Holy Spirit. So he's the Messiah, but also, Mark says, he is the Son of God. 
Now, this was an incredibly bold move right at the beginning of this gospel. It had been ascribed to the kings of Israel, to the nation of Israel before, so it wasn't in that sense something new. But Mark pushes it much further because he quotes here both Isaiah and Malachi in, chapters, uh, in verses 2 and 3. And the prophets describe God's return to his people. But in Mark's version, do you notice, John is the messenger, the forerunner going ahead. Who's the Lord? Jesus is the Lord. So somehow, Jesus and God, they're one and the same. And it's this God who is doing something new in this man. Something that is as significant as creation was. Something irresistible. That is Mark's testimony. Mark's witness. And John the Baptist confirms that testimony. So let's look at the witness of the messenger. See, John points to Jesus. It's really clear from the outset, isn't it, that John isn't a rival. He's not in competition with Jesus. He's not a, an alternative to Jesus. He's the messenger. He's the forerunner. And that was uh, something that was, or someone that had been prophesied long ago. So the people of Israel were waiting for the forerunner. He was expected. He was hoped for. They hoped particularly for the prophet Elijah. You see, Elijah didn't die. He went up to be with God in a fiery chariot. So there was this expectation that he would return again, announcing the reign of God himself. So what John is saying here is that not only is this a new creation, this is the new exodus. And of course, the Exodus, the original Exodus, the story of God's rescue of his people from slavery in Egypt, uh, out into, through the Red Sea, into the wilderness, into the Promised Land, that is the defining story of the people of Israel. And John is saying, this is not just new creation, this is another Exodus. This is a story of deliverance, of liberation. This is a new defining moment for Israel. And for the whole of humanity. And that's why he calls the people into the wilderness. This was the Judean desert, the badlands. And of course the people of God were um, in the wilderness for 40 years. It was a place of extremes, a place of limits. But it was also a place of preparation. Because it's in the wilderness that we come to the end of ourselves. It's where we find ourselves purged of all that is wrong within us. And so it is also a place of grace where we find God's mercy ministering to us as we come to the end of ourselves. So he takes them out into the wilderness to prepare them and he immerses them in water. And in one sense, at one level, this is just a ritual bath. It's a cleansing. It's a washing. It's a new start. But at another level... He's taking them through the Red Sea, like the new people of God, out into the wilderness, towards the promised land. And he says Jesus immerses, not in water, but in the Spirit. You see, John's message is always about someone else. It's about Jesus. And he says he's more powerful than I am. He says he's more worthy than I am, much more worthy than I am. I shouldn't even be doing up his shoelaces. He says Jesus is the spirit baptizer. He's the one who can plunge you into the presence of God. And that, he says, is better than the Exodus. In the wilderness, the people of God, they had the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, where God dwelt by day, they were led by the pillar of fire, the symbol of God's presence in the community. By night, it was the pillar, sorry, pillar of cloud, pillar of fire by night. And John is saying what Jesus promises is something far more profound than that. This is full immersion in the presence of God. And so John here is preparing the people to go on a new exodus to meet the king. We say, don't we, in the UK, everywhere the queen goes, she smells fresh paint. And that's precisely what John is doing for his king. 
He is getting everything ready. But the people weren't ready for the coming of King Jesus. And it's a question we have to ask ourselves. Are we ready to meet him? Are we in the wilderness uh, as, as a place of purging where we are being prepared day by day to meet our king? Or has the wilderness become a place of wandering, of drift, of aimless meandering as the ordinariness of life kind of overwhelms us as we uh, commute day by day into work, as we sit at our desks, as we uh, do the childcare, as we do the shopping, as we pay the bills, as we do a bit of DIY on the weekend, as we travel around the world. Whatever we do, have we lost our way? And John the Baptist here is trying to shock us out of our stupor. God is doing something new, something fresh. It's irresistible. It's like, I've had a lot of these in the last few weeks, a long sleepless night where at the end of it you just begin to drift off and then almost immediately you're jolted awake by the alarm clock and you think it cannot really be morning already, can it? And John says, yes, it is. The new exodus is here. God is coming for his people. So we have the witness of the writer. This is new creation. We have the witness of the messenger. This is the new exodus. And then we have the witness of the father. And it's in verse 9 that Jesus finally enters the story. And he's been baptized by John. But that's not the main focus really at all. It almost, you know... Gets it over and done with, and then he comes up out of the water, and then we have this striking scene. God himself takes the stand as a witness for his son. And Jesus is is wrapped up in God's testimony. And it's something truly beautiful, I think. Truly irresistible. You see, Mark here offers us a glimpse of reality. He says that heaven is torn open. The curtain, if you like, is pulled back and we see things as they truly are. And so we move beyond Exodus and the liberation of the people of God. We move beyond even creation. Beyond Genesis. And we arrive at the essence of the universe. We are given a glimpse of the interior life of God himself. And there, in this life of God, we see love. We see relationship. And what we see here in this moment in history is what has been happening in God for eternity. Always, forever, never-ending love. C.S. Lewis, the writer, said this. In Christianity... God is not a static thing, but a dynamic, pulsating activity, a life, almost a kind of drama, almost, if you will not think me irreverent, a kind of dance. Cornelius Plantinga, a Christian philosopher, goes a bit further, and he says, the persons within God exalt each other. They commune with each other and defer to one another. Each divine person harbors the others at the center of his being. In constant movement of overture and acceptance, each person envelops and encircles the other. God's interior life, therefore, overflows with regard for others. Just contemplate that for a moment. The father delights in his son. The Father glorifies the Son. The Son glorifies the Father. Why do they do that? Because they find each other beautiful. Jesus' beauty captures his Father's imagination. Jesus' beauty compels his Father to adore him. And of course what that means is that God is profoundly and infinitely happy. Because it's when we love someone else that we find true happiness, isn't it? 
And the Father and the Spirit are enamored by the beauty of Jesus as he is by their beauty. And so love and joy and adoration, it defines the interior life of God. And I don't know about you, but I find that an irresistible picture of the divine life. And so we have the witness of the writer. He says, this is new creation that's taking place through this man. We have the witness of the messenger. This is a new exodus. This king will lead his people out of slavery. And we have the witness of the father. Here is the glimpse of the essence of the universe. This is, in this man, what the divine life really looks like. So what we see, just to wrap up, is in this irresistible Jesus, God is doing something new. It's creative. God is present in a new way that his people have never known before. And that's because God's interior life has been exposed. We can see for the first time the essence of the universe and we can see that it is relationship. And the extraordinary miracle is this. God invites us into that relationship. And that means that Jesus also offers us an irresistible vision of humanity. Yes, Jesus shows us the life of God. But he also shows us a human being in true communion with God. A human being shot through with the presence of God. A human being transparent to the energies of God. A human being loved and cherished by his Father. A human being full of joy and peace and delight. A human being truly happy. And that means that he can overcome temptation. It means that he can uh, face opposition and rejection. It means that he can go through death and come out the other side. Don't you want that? He wants you to have that. To be like that. And you find it in Jesus. And he wants you. Isn't that almost irresistible? I think it is. It's Jesus, the irresistible king. Let's pray.